What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the Hot Sauce. This is Angel Planel, a registered dietitian nutritionist in Seattle, Washington. I just cracked 100 subscribers, and the goal is to make it to 250. So do me a solid and like, comment, and subscribe, and let's get right into it. Today, we are going to feature Neva Cochran, a registered dietitian nutritionist that resides in Dallas, Texas. Welcome back to the hot sauce. Today we have Neva Cochran. I'm gonna put her in the hot seat here, even though there's not a hot seat. And Neva, it's, uh, I've known you for a long time. Why don't you give us your journey, talk about what you got, how you got into the profession, where you went to college, your internship, and your current job, plus your journey into the profession. All Go right. for it. Thanks, Angel. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for including me in this new series that you're doing. I think it's really great. Um, you know, I never had a great plan to become a dietitian. That was not on my radar, radar screen at all. But I did take what we used to call home ec or home economics for four years in high school. I'm really dating myself. And it wasn't because I wanted to pursue a career in home economics. I just enjoyed the content. We did nutrition, we did cooking, sewing, household management, all those things that, you know, women back then needed to know to manage a house or, you know, home economics. Um, but I was really a good student. I excelled in everything and I particularly enjoyed math and science, but I never wanted to major in home ec because I thought it was like an easy major and it was things that, it was something that people did that really weren't smart enough to do anything tougher than that. Uh, but I did read a book in high school called Careers in Home Economics, and it just outlined all the different opportunities that there were. I don't remember a single career in that book except work for a food company. And it was kind of interesting because in a way it foretold what my future would be many years down the line, but I had no idea at the time how I would actually make that happen. So I majored in math. When I went to the University of Oklahoma, uh, because I'd always been good at math and one of my teachers said, you should do that. So I thought, okay, I'll do that. I had no idea what I would do with a degree in math, but I was uh, taking it. And after two semesters, I decided math is not for me. Um, I took analytic geometry, I took calculus, and after calculus, I just didn't enjoy math anymore. I made an A, but it wasn't fun. And so I said, I can't do this. Uh, so I went without a major for a couple of semesters. And one of the things I did was I took a philosophy course called elementary logic and that's when i realized that it wasn't really math that i liked but it was the logic that was involved it was the problem solving and that's why i like science because everything was about solving a problem and in my life now i see everywhere i go i'm solving problems whether it be a science problem or a people problem uh, so i had a sorority sister who was majoring in nutrition so i said well what do you have to do to major in nutrition? And I looked through the catalog and I found out that you had to take all of this science like physiology and chemistry and biochemistry and microbiology, but yet it was something that would be a challenging major with courses I enjoyed, but it was so practical. It applied to everybody because everybody needed to eat. Everybody needed to have good nutrition. So I felt it was like the perfect major for me. And I was able, even the starting the second semester of my sophomore year into that major, I was able to finish in four years by going to summer school and taking chemistry after my sophomore year and after my junior year. But I did end up graduating in four years, which was my father's goal because he was gonna cut the money off after that. Um, and so then I uh, applied for my uh, two internships that we were allowed to apply for at that time. We could only apply to two. So the one that I was accepted at uh, was Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas, which is now called Texas Health Resources Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas. It's part of a big system here in the Dallas, North Texas area. And that was a 12 month generalist internship. So it covered community, um, food service and clinical. And right out of my internship, I became the clinical dietitian, the first and only clinical dietitian for a small private hospital in Denton, Texas, which is about 30 miles north of Dallas. It's a university town, home of two universities. And I was charged with setting up the entire clinical nutrition program, which they had not had. The hospital had been open a year and a half and they had a dietitian food service director and the clinical nutrition for that hospital was a diet clerk handing the patient a sheet for their diet. 
So I had to set up the whole program, develop the educational materials, and that was really a daunting task for a new graduate. But it was really a wonderful opportunity because I reported directly to the administrator. And this was like in the good old days when insurance and Medicare were paying off. And I didn't really realize what he was doing, but in retrospect, I do. He wanted me out in the community. He said, get the students over here uh, to work with you because there were nutrition programs at both of the universities. Go out to, in the community, talk to different groups. He was really using me as a marketing tool to bring people to our hospital. Um, but after working there a little over a year, I decided that was not my dream job and that was not what I wanted to do forever. And in working with uh, the faculty at Texas Women's University, where I was uh, precepting students, they were encouraging me to come back for my master's. So I just decided to go back and do my master's in nutrition full time. And I was fortunate to have an assistantship, a graduate assistantship doing teaching and research. And also they had just launched or opened a renal dialysis center and I had been working with that nephrologist in the hospital. So I was able to become the consultant dietitian for that renal dialysis unit in addition to my assistantship. So I was able to live for those two years it took me to get my master's. And after I finished, I went back to the hospital, Presbyterian Hospital of Dallas, where I did my internship. I worked there as a clinical dietitian for one year. And then I was invited back to Texas Women's University where I did my master's to be on their faculty of what was then a coordinated undergraduate program in dietetics. And after three and a half years there, I went to our local dairy council. And that's where I really discovered my niche. Um, it was nutrition education, public relations, media, community nutrition. I absolutely loved it. So. I realized that hospital and healthcare dietetics were not really for me. But when I started out, that was basically all there was. You worked in a hospital, uh, either clinical, food service, or you were in community like WIC or public health, or you were in school nutrition or um, higher education teaching dietetics students. Right, okay. Well, that's <clears throat> that's pretty cool. Your your whole journey is, is awesome. I know that um, most people will recognize you for your media work. Um, what would you say has been uh, one of the most enlightening aspects and, and one of the most humbling aspects of doing media and communications, which, you know, you've, you've done a lot yeah. of things. You know, Angel, I wanted to just elaborate a little more oh, on, sorry, my, sorry. on my journey. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I, um, as I said, you know, those were the only options out there. But uh, when I worked at the Dairy Council, um, you know, I really realized that was where my passion was. And what was interesting, you know, kind of segueing into the media that you were talking about, at the same time I started with the Dairy Council, I also started as a state media rep for Texas. And that's when they first opened up the state media rep program, the National Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics did. And so I was selected as one of the two first state media reps for Texas. And I uh, got some great training. Back then, they would do uh, national training for the state media reps. And so I got this wonderful professional training. And I did that position for five years. And I did about 90 media interviews during that time. Then the, the position for uh, the National Academy spokesperson for the Dallas-Fort Worth market came open and I applied for that and I was appointed to that and I did that for seven years. So my work with the media as a volunteer spokesperson for the Texas Academy uh, really dovetailed nicely with the work that I was doing for Dairy Council because I was doing media there as well. Um, after uh, three and a half years with Dairy Council, that's when I went out on my own as a nutrition consultant. And initially, I did a lot of different things. I taught in an outpatient cardiac rehab program one day a week for 13 years. I had a foray into food service. I conducted sanitation and safety audits for uh, Taco Bell and Brugger's Bagels as a subcontractor for Audits International. And interestingly enough, they contracted with dietitians across the United States to do these audits. It was only registered dietitians that were doing these audits. And I thought that that was really, you know, a, a, a real uh, key accomplishment uh, that dietitians were recognized for, you know, that ability to do these sanitation and safety audits of restaurants. Um, I worked with some restaurants locally in Dallas doing menu analysis and consulting um, with the Dallas-Fort Worth Chinese Restaurant Association. 
Um, I also, for 20 years, was a freelance writer and researcher for Women's World Magazine, and that was a contact I made through volunteer, being a volunteer spokesperson, because they were calling me for quotes, and then they asked me to work for them. Never dreamed it would last for 20 years. Um, I wrote for Maximum Fitness and the Female Patient magazines for five years each. Um, but over the years, I gradually began doing more spokesperson, paid spokesperson work for companies and organizations and commodity groups as those opportunities expanded for dietitians. And I could only do that after I finished being an academy spokesperson because there was that conflict of interest with doing speaking for the academy and speaking for someone else. Um, and then around 2009, with the advent of uh, social media and with the internet, I was able to successfully kind of segue from doing the traditional media like magazines and uh, television and radio to doing more internet for clients like blogging and social media and speaking and webinars. So in the last several years, I've had a lot of more uh, focused on agricultural clients like Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, Bear US Crop Science, California Cantaloupe Board, Grass Run Farms, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Texas Beef Council, Egg Nutrition Center, California Raisin Marketing Board, and more. So I really like kind of focus more on the agricultural arena and the link between how our food is grown, how it's processed, and then how it gets to the table and what you as a consumer can do to enjoy the abundance of food that we have here in the United States. Um, over the years, I've worked with other companies like Mazzola and Lean Cuisine, uh, Calorie Control Council, Bigelow Tea, Fresh Express Salads, doing a lot of media and speaking and blogging and in all activities involved with nutrition communication and getting out the word about healthy foods and eating for good health. Yeah. I've also had a number of leadership positions um, within the academy at the state uh, local and national level. I've been president of the Texas and Dallas academies. I've been in the Academy House of Delegates. I've been the um, the Academy Foundation Board and the chair. Um, I've been uh, an officer in practice groups and been on numerous committees at all levels. So, you know, that's kind of a nutshell, you know, my career <laughs> over a long time. Yeah, no, no, that's awesome. And I, I greatly appreciate you elaborating on that because I, I think it's it's very fascinating to hear um, someone with a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience because as you mentioned or alluded to earlier, some people might think clinical, food service, um, you know, school lunch or higher ed is, and that's the only avenues and that's the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, you just you ticked off a bunch of boxes there. That is, that is amazing. And so, no, I, I greatly appreciate that. So going back to my question, yeah. you know, doing all this media and communication, what do you feel has been the most enlightening or what has been the most humbling aspect of, of doing media and communication? What would you say? You know, I think enlightening is that through the media, you can reach a huge number of people with just a short interview. But like when I was um, a spokesperson, I did several interviews with CNN and sometimes this would get even on CNN International and I would have people that were in other parts of the country or had even been out of the country say I saw you on television today I saw you on CNN and just thinking about the reach that you have and the same thing when I was working for Women's World at one point it was the most uh, largest circulated magazine that was purchased on newsstands that didn't include include subscriptions like there were magazines with subscriptions right. that had higher circulations but Women's World really wasn't subscription driven it was at the checkout at the grocery store and I had a column in there called Diet Club and at one point through focus groups they learned that that was the most read uh, feature in the magazine so thinking about how many women that might never see a dietitian were getting information that was like very enlightening that I could have an impact like that but it was also very humbling to know, you know, that I had that responsibility to make sure that I was giving accurate and actionable information that these women or people, viewers and readers of all the media I was doing, you know, were getting the good information that they could actually use to improve their nutrition and health. Um, I think another humbling aspect that I was able to gain uh, the most amazing experience and training and contacts through being a media spokesperson that literally changed the trajectory of my career. You know, I'm so grateful for this opportunity because I would not be doing what I'm doing today 
if I had not taken on that role as a volunteer. And as you know, it's a huge amount of work, but in the end, it really, you know, was very, uh, it paid off in giving me so many opportunities to promote science-based nutrition and the RD as a nutrition expert. And when I was at Women's World, I had this column for eight years. Every week, I was quoting a dietitian in that column. So I just really, you know, am passionate about promoting our profession and the registered dietitian nutritionist. And you know, the media was a way that I could do that. That is awesome to hear. No, I, it's really funny because I, I feel the same way in my short time doing it. It's like you do an article, it gets sent all around the world. People message over saying, hey, this is pretty cool. Or actually, you talk about full circle. I did an article in GQ about recovering from hangovers. And one of the parents, one of the parents at my soccer team that I was coaching said, hey, Angel told me how to deal with my hangovers. <laughs> it's like, I was like, what? Oh, great. So it, just, it just kind of shows the whole world, like, you know, you, you make a quote and it doesn't feel like a it may feel like a throwaway quote, but people will see it all around the world. And that's pretty awesome to be able to influence people because there's a lot of social media junk out there. You know, people, you know, I lost 20 pounds doing the grapefruit diet. Now everyone needs to do the grapefruit diet. Is yeah. that not really sustainable? So thank you. Thank you for all your work. Yes. yes. I like, since I've been in the profession, I, I've basically known you for media and communication. So I didn't know the, the early backstory. So that's great to hear. So thank you for that. So, Question, the next question is, you know, if you could do it all over again in your career, what would you change and, and what would you keep the same? You know, this is a very interesting anecdote that I just thought of. Um, you know, in my first job that I mentioned in that small private hospital, um, I decided to launch an outpatient nutrition counseling program. And I guess that was pretty revolutionary at the time. But my administrator, told me we were going to charge for it. I mean, I think that's what was really revolutionary, that we were going to charge for it. So my administrator suggested that I call around to area hospitals and find out what they were charging. So I set out, had my list, called, because you didn't have email at that time, so that was the way you could communicate. So I called and talked to these uh, the dietitians or the directors, and it was amazing because most of them didn't charge. In fact, they were appalled. They go, we don't charge. Um, we do this as a service for our doctors. And I was thinking, well, you're seeing patients that aren't in the hospital. So now that's taking away the time from the dietitian, seeing the patients that are in the hospital, they're actually paying for the service. Um, so it didn't make sense. So we decided that we would charge. And I was working with the business office on setting this all up so that when the patients came in, came in we'd have a mechanism for you know, charging them and them paying. And this business office, young guy in the business office, he said, you know, let me call one of, let me call Blue Cross and see if we can get this covered by insurance. I said, yeah, that's great. So, you know, I just kind of went along my way and, and then he comes back a while later, you know, a few weeks or month. And he said, you know, th I'm just not getting anywhere with this. So we'll just like take cash from the patients and, you know, go on from there. And I said, fine. And that's what I did. But, you know, in retrospect, reimbursement for dietitians wasn't even anything that anyone was talking about at that time. And if I had just said, no, no, let's pursue this a little further. Let's be a little more diligent about it. Who knows what could have happened? Because I didn't right. know how important it was. And I think, golly, if I'd really, you know, worked with him, maybe we could have changed the whole landscape way back before anyone was talking about it. Um, but one of the things that I really would do if I had it to do over again is I, is I have a mentor. I never had a mentor. It just wasn't really a thing back then. We didn't talk about it. Um, and so I kind of like figured out things on my own. But one thing that has been a result of that is that I have been a preceptor for dietetic interns since 2003 for a week-long nutrition communications rotation. And I've had about 130 dietetic interns work with me and many of them I've gone on to mentor. And I also have other younger dietitians that I've um, mentored over the years. And I just really feel good when I see, you know, where they go and the success that I, they, they've had. And I'm really proud that uh, among those dietitians that are now considered rock stars, um, Angela Lamond is one of my mentees. Amy Goodson is one of my mentees. So, you know, it's, it's really been quite humbling and rewarding to have done that. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, the, the fact that you've been able to precept 130 people, they're, you know, they're going to look at you and I'm sure they looked at you as a, you know, as a rock star and, you know, it's, it's, it's great to hear. That's a, that's amazing to have that type of impact. So thank you for that. 
Um, next question for you. What does the future hold for you? What would you, what do you say? Um, I um, am actually moving towards retiring. Now I have been doing this since COVID began and it hasn't actually worked out <laughs> um, because things just keep happening and opportunities keep coming. Um, but I have been this year kind of, kind of segueing out. And of course, as you know, I've had some personal situations over the last couple of years that have necessitated me pulling back a little bit, but I have still been doing some speaking and doing some webinars and uh, I still have one client that I'm working actively with. Um, but my, my plan ideally would be to continue speaking um, at conferences and doing webinars and also doing like unpaid social media work to promote science-based nutrition and the registered dietitian nutritionist as the expert, you know, so that I can dispel, as you mentioned, this food and nutrition information that's just rampant on the internet and social media. And in doing this, I have a new mentee from a program that's uh, a joint project between the Texas A&M University and the University of North Florida. And she's just started working with me. She's going to be with me through April. And she is going to be helping we ramp up my social media, my nutrition social media again. Um, we're kind of working together on a plan so that we'll have more of a strategic focus in doing this and really focusing on the hot topics that I like to deal with with my Eating Beyond the Headlines brand. Um, I've also been working on advocacy for dietitians with disabilities for the last six and a half years. This is something I just kind of fell into when a young member contacted me after hearing me speak on a webinar to see if I had any advice for her with matching with an internship. She had a mobility uh, disability and thought that might be one of the reasons. And so in trying to help her and hook her up with some other dietitians, um, I remembered a colleague I'd known since early in my career in Dallas who had moved on to become a research professor, Dr. Susie Baxter. She had developed a disability um, within the past 10 years or so. Um, and had, as a result, had had to quit her job as a research professor. But I brought her on basically to just help me with this one young woman. But after a few months, she really saw a bigger vision and that this was something that our profession and our organization needed to address. So we have really synergistic skills because she's into research and grant writing and publishing. And I'm into public relations and communication and marketing and have a vast knowledge of the academy. So we have really worked together and we've had so much success in publishing journal articles and DPG newsletter articles and doing webinars. And we even had a presentation at FINCI and we have another presentation coming up at this FINCI. I have three of my dietitians with disabilities presenting on um, nutrition for patients with disabilities, tactics from the trenches. And that'll be on Monday during FINCI. Um, and we also are launching a member interest group or MIG for uh, disabilities in nutrition and dietetics. And that was approved by the board in March. And we will, uh, we're working on the infrastructure to develop that this year. So it will launch for the 2022-2023 dues years of the Academy. So we're very excited to be, you know, having that to increase opportunities as well as um, visibility of disabilities, both for dietitians or dietetic professionals that have them, as well as working with patients and clients with disabilities. Yeah, no, that that is awesome. I, I definitely... Um, one of the great aspects of the Academy is the MIG, you know, the member interest group. And to have that, it would be a great resource because, you know, if you are working with a number of different people, you're going to end up, you know, you may deal with uh, quadriplegics or cerebral palsy or all these different things. It'd be great information for people to, uh, great resource for people. So, you know, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. And I know, I know the people you're talking about, so I look forward to uh, go into that session. So awesome. Great. And then the final question for you, any words of wisdom for the next generation of dietitians? You've been doing it for a, a good while. I won't yeah. say a long time. You've been doing it for a good while, but you know, and I know you've, you've mentioned a lot of things throughout, but you know, if you could give us a couple of words of advice. I have them. Um, I, you know, have been asked that question for several years by interns or young dietitians or just students. And I actually came up with this and I don't know when, how, or where, but I just started saying it and it is take opportunities, make opportunities and walk through fear. 
And I, I actually was asked to present the commencement address to the College of Health Sciences at Texas Women's University in 2016. And it was just a 10 minute speech. And that was the topic that I chose. And I really traced, I told the story of my career as a media dietitian for my very first job and how I took opportunities, made opportunities and walked through fear to end up where I am today. And um, so that's, that's my, you know, best advice, you know, don't, if you want to have a career that you're passionate about, no matter what area, it doesn't have to be media. It could be like nutrition support. It could be sports nutrition, but just take opportunities and then find ways to make other opportunities. And then it's scary, but you just got to walk through it and you'll come out on the other side with such a, a, a fulfilling career and really helping people and enjoying what you do. And the other thing, just my final word is I would suggest getting a mentor. Um, I think that you need to find people in the area that you think you're interested in pursuing, talk to them. And, you know, as I said, like Amy Goodson, Angela Lamond and Caroline Susie, who are really amazing dietitians, have all been people that I have mentored. So um, it's, it's uh, you know, something that I highly recommend. Great. Well, with that being said, I greatly appreciate you and your time. And I uh, look forward to seeing you at Fancy and, and just thank you for being a part of the podcast. It's been wonderful to hear your story. Oh. And I'm also on the platform, Buy Me a Coffee. This is a platform that allows creators like myself to create content and get rewarded in a variety of payments. I've decided to do it via coffee. So if you'd like to buy me a coffee, you can do so. And if you want to send one to the individual I'm interviewing, send it to me and I will send it their way. With that being said, thank you very much for being here with us today. I hope you really enjoyed the video and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.